Perfect timing. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. Welcome back after your, the lunch break. And uh, welcome to this technical workshop on VertiPorts that we are going to host this afternoon as a first afternoon session. Uh, my name is Giuseppe Scanapico. I work in EASA as a, in the drone section as a, a project manager. I'm in charge of the uh, rulemaking task activities uh, for the certified category. So uh, all what you will see in the next uh, weeks or months uh, regarding the urban air mobility and uh, uh, operation of certified drones uh, will, keep, will be coming uh, through the group that I have the pleasure of, coordi of coordinating. Today, uh, we are going to discuss a very interesting subject, which is fundamental for the achievement of success of urban air mobility. And it's a completely new subject uh, that uh, uh, is being currently uh, somehow we have the, the opportunity to shape the future when it comes to vertiports, how they will look like, how people are going to operate from, from, uh, from these uh, uh, specific places. We have put together a, a, set, a set of experts that will give you a, let's say, 360 overview uh, on the subject. We have colleagues uh, from the agency, aerodrome experts, we have the national aviation authorities, I will introduce them to you as they will go on scene. And then we have also the uh, outlook offered by the industry with vertiports operators and future uh, operators of VTOL aircraft. Um, let's start first with one joke this afternoon, so to keep you awake. What is the mistake in this uh, picture? Can anybody tell me what is the mistake in this picture? No, not yet. So it means that you have not yet read <laughs> the prototype technical specifications right. that we have issued last week. <laughs> and there is a mistake in that picture because instead of an H, there will be a V <laughs> for vertebrae. <laughs> so that was the first, the first point to, to, to keep you awake for and prepare for the discussion. So, of course, it will not be me. I will be moderating, moderating the panel. Uh, it will be my colleague that I have the pleasure to introduce. My colleague is uh, Predrag Sekulic. Uh, he has a background. At, uh, he started at uh, Ljubljana Airport as engineer, and then has been working for the Ministry of Transport of the Republic of Slovenia at the CAE as well. And uh, since 2009, uh, he works at, at EASA as an aerodrome expert. He's involved with the definition of technical requirements and certification specification for, uh, for aerodromes and, and, uh, and heliports. And actually, he is our working group uh, lead that is uh, managing the team of experts, uh, of stakeholders from the industry and from the aviation authorities that are helping us in shaping the future regulation on, uh, on uh, vertiports. I will hand over now the floor to, to Predrag, and Predrag will, uh, will explain us so why, for the time being, you will be reading about prototype technical specifications and not yet about rules. Rules will come, and Predrag will give you the long-time planning and overview of the agency on this topic. Thank you very much, Giuseppe. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming uh, after, after lunch, and good to see all you here. Uh, uh, this, is, this is a short story about saga of two and a half year about the developments of prototype technical specifications. When you mentioned, Giuseppe, why PTS, uh, this is uh, actually because of uh, basic regulation uh, that, we, uh, that, we, that we have and mandate, mandate of EASA. Uh, which means that vertiports in the scope are in the scope of EASA. I mean, uh, if you look at the Article 2 of basic regulation, it defines which aerodromes and heliports and consequentially also vertiports are in the scope. And uh, uh, we had the pressure, if I may say pressure or interest of industry for developing something harmonized uh, for the uh, taking off and landing 
uh, we call these verti ports. <coughs> and uh, uh, on another side, uh, member states uh, ask EASA, I can also say request EASA, to develop a guidance uh, for the, uh, if I may say also, verti ports now, yeah? And that was an agreement at the MAB, we say Management Advisory Body of EASA, to develop uh, a guidance uh, for the vertiports, design of the vertiports. Now, why we have a prototype technical specification? Because, uh, as our uh, executive director said, uh, we had a great opportunity to start from the scratch. And uh, when we say guidance, uh, our legal department or legal uh, reference to uh, something that is already a regulation. Uh, so we came then to the prototype technical specification. As you say, for example, in the school, you have a school book for working. Uh, this is something what we are offering now to you all, actually, uh, as the outcome of this discussion and agreement about the design of vertiports. And I will explain in my presentation why it is a, a, a saga of the fellowship of the, let's say, vertiport task force ring. And we really uh, had a, had a, a wider, wider discussion and participants in our in our task force, which membered about 50, 50 participants and 50 experts. Um, yes, you want to refer yes, to this I one? want to I want just uh, to introduce you to this. So uh, you will be able to ask questions through Slido. Please go to uh, slido.com, and when you're prompted, please insert the hashtag 718893. That will give you the possibility to ask questions uh, also from those that are following from, from home. And we will use the same tool also for you uh, that are seated here in this meeting room so that anybody has the possibility to, to use the same means. Thank you. Thank you, Giuseppe. So, um, Vertiport Design Developments, uh, although now the, the, the title of the document is a bit, uh, bit uh, wider and longer, uh, just a short background because I have to say thanks to all participants in the in the in the ring in the in the in the fellowship. Uh, we had the National Aviation Authorities uh, Aerodrome and Future or current Vertiport uh, Vertiport operators, particularly VTOL aircraft manufacturers and experts from EASA and the industry outside. Uh, I have to say that we had also a wider industry coordination on our. Uh, uh, draft uh, PTS. Uh, what is our baseline for the discussion? Because, uh, as I said, we started from scratch, uh, uh, made, a, made a short team of uh, 10, 12 people, and lately, at the very end, we had about 50 experts really contributing to the development of this. Uh, <coughs> first of all, uh, what, we have, uh, what we have globally is IKO, IKO documentation. Lately, uh, uh, we have also the heliport manual, uh, which which helped us uh, helped us a lot, and you you can see in the PTS a lot of copy paste from the heliport and the manual IKO Annex 14 Volume 2, uh, as well as uh, EASA certification specifications. For sure, you know about this uh, for aerodromes and also for heliports. That was uh, that was our uh, our beginning. Now, uh, why we have two steps uh, of developing vertiport design requirements. The first step, as I said, uh, is for, uh, for VFR manned, VFR operation with manned VTOL aircraft, which means uh, this is a non-regulatory material for the design of an operation of vertiports. <coughs> and it is composed, uh, uh, as you, as you know from other documents in Annex 14 about the uh, physical characteristics, obstacle environment, and you can find there something inno innovative, uh, which we call uh, obstacle-free volume or funnel, for example, <coughs> visual, visual aids and uh, uh, requirements for Enron Vertiport, uh, alternate Vertiports for CSFL. Uh, so we do not use landing site, operation site, whatever you find in in, in OPS, OPS documents and documentation and regulation. We have a departure, destination, and alternate vertical port for CSFL. This is what we deal and with, uh, with, with what you will find in PTS and later on. 
<coughs> you see in the brackets that rescue and firefighting <coughs> requirements. Uh, you, you can find a couple of pages in PTS. However, uh, however, they are not developed simply because we do not have uh, yet input uh, and data to develop something which is which can deal with the composite f fire, uh, 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 battery fire, etc. Yeah. So this is uh, for our second step, and we count on the uh, input from all of you. <coughs> Timeline certified categories. So this is what we are talking here about uh, providing MPA. Uh, in Q1, we already finished this and published. Uh, we said this is not a link directly to the regulation and NPA. This is something aside, as I said, and I'm, 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 uh, I'm repeating this. This is our non-regulatory material. <laughs> what you can find in uh, PTS, and you see here the, the, full, the full title, it's a prototype technical specification for the design of VFR vertiports for manned operation in enhanced category exclusively. Uh, some innovative or some novelties from the document uh, you can find here. I put just, just as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a examples. This is geometry, geometry-based parking positions. Then, for example, uh, uh, maneuvering area, taxiways, parking positions, etc. We had a wide discussion uh, why to use Annex, uh, Annex 14 Volume 1 and CSs for aerodromes as well as uh, for heliports because some of the vehicles are performing as an aircraft or aeroplane at the maneuvering area. And then we take some, took some inputs from uh, Volume 1 aerodromes and CSs for aerodromes. <coughs> you see some innovative uh, markings which uh, you use for the introduction. Uh, this is a proposal uh, which we during the discussion, we said, okay, let's go, let's go with this one. Blue, maybe something electric, whatever. Uh, however, it should be tested. This is not yet tested from, let's say, simulators to see uh, what is the pilot view on this. Uh, we, had, we had different views in the, in the task force, I, I, I have to say. But finally, we said, okay, let's go with this one. Uh, you saw in some other documents, maybe some other markings, okay? We will see during the harmonization, which we are looking forward for this. And uh, something uh, very innovative, this is obstacle-free volume. Good point is that we discussed with manufacturers about this, and we discussed with the certification colleagues uh, from, from EASA, which is aligned with MOCs and special conditions. So uh, this is uh, actually in this ring what I'm saying about that we had this, this discussion. And this is what we are proposing. And in the, in the, in the, in the document, you can find how to design, design obstacle-free volume. Of course, with the conventional surfaces, which is already provided by Annex 14 and certification specifications for heliports. If you do not have obstacles, you can go with simple uh, conventional surfaces along. Step two, uh, this, is, uh, this is the second, second step of the saga of, uh, of fellowship. Uh, let me say like this. <coughs> this is a full package of uh, regulation for vertiports within the scope of basic regulation. So vertiports that are commercial, open to public use, and using instrument approach and departure procedures are in the scope of EASA basic regulation. So we have then to provide full package of rules as we have for aerodromes and heliports. <coughs> so what does it mean? Implementing rules for, uh, for authority requirements, for operator, vertiport operator requirements, plus operation requirements, which you cannot find in ICAO documentation, only the design. And of course, uh, certification specifications, <coughs> which is the second step for what we have now to provide uh, validate, tested, and really confirmed data. So all PTSs have to be confirmed then for the, for the second step. This is a timeline, certified category 23-24, with implementing rules, and we will see if we can also provide certification specifications. For note, vertiports are by the definition classified as aerodromes. This is what we agreed with Commission and our legal. <laughs> vertiports in the scope of basic regulation you can find in Article 2, and I have to say any facility or part of the vertiport that are located at the aerodrome in the scope is also at the scope which was discussed uh, last, uh, last previous, previous discussion, what about vertiport nearby the aerodrome? So if the aerodrome is in the scope, this is also in the scope, 
And also then it deals with one aerodrome operator which cover also vertiport op operator. Otherwise, this is different. <coughs> Maybe this is not the right conclusions. This is also the way forward. Uh, this is, as I said, to support, uh, to support uh, VTOL aircraft development, to support member states. As I said also, uh, this should be tested and verified. We are looking forward for global harmonization, of course, uh, and this will be in the second step. Now, when it goes to urban environment, special planning, uh, this, is, uh, this is a question for, uh, for, uh, for local, for national aviation authorities, etc. Uh, when it comes now to certification, this is open question, because we are providing in the second step certification specifications to certify vertiports by the national aviation authorities. So then it has to be also dealt with the, with the trainings, competencies, competencies, et cetera. This is what I put here also about the CAS staff planning resources, competencies, et cetera. And what, what is the most important uh, is uh, input. So we need data, we need input. In the beginning of PTS, you have a letter that we shared with the uh, manufacturers to provide us data that we can that then we can develop something as it is already here. However, we are looking forward now to be tested and validated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frederick. I think this is important uh, that you, get, you have now a better overview how this uh, topic will evolve in the next years and what are the necessary steps ahead. I think what you just said in your conclusions about the effort on the, uh, that, uh, the subsequent effort that uh, will have to be done by the National Aviation Authority is a good uh, bridging uh, to our next expert. Uh, we have Arturo Madrigal, um, engineer with 22 years of experience working in, uh, mainly in uh, uh, certification and oversight and M SMS for airports, aerodrome and airports, and uh, heliports, sorry. Uh, he's currently working as a, a consultant as, uh, and head of Senas Airport Technical Assistance for the Spanish Aviation Authority. And he's also uh, a member, well, rapporteur uh, at AKO for the Heliport Design Working Group, and of course, member of uh, our EASA Task Force on Vertiports. So, uh, Arturo, can you explain us what will be the main challenges that uh, the NAA will be facing when uh, time will come for the authorization process, for the oversight of Vertiports, and uh, what will be the challenges of this? Uh, vertiports when they will be in urban environments? Well, uh, yes, uh, I'll try, but uh, before, <coughs> thank you to the audience for coming to to see us at the, after lunch, and thank you for EASA for allowing us to uh, participate in this uh, exciting uh, project. So, and now uh, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Spanish Aviation Authority, the Spanish uh, Air Safety Agency, okay, and um, I will try to explain uh, what will we face as a national aviation authority when our colleagues here, Saskia, Gonzalo, Simon, comes to the last. Uh, we want to build a network of Bertie ports and we want to begin operations. So please uh, certify your license as this activity. How do we do that? How do, how do we prepare to have it ready in time? Okay. Um, so. As I said, I'm here on in behalf of uh, the Spanish Air Safety Agency, okay? Uh, but I belong to a company called Senasa, which is a state-owned company that uh, uh, provides uh, expert technical advice to to the Spanish Air Safety Agency, okay? So, now, uh, we will be facing uh, the authorization, certification, licensing, of, let's hope, a large number of, of Berti ports uh, in, in Europe, all along Europe, okay? So, a significant number of Berti ports, let's hope we have a significant number of Berti ports. Uh, these Berti ports will be public use mostly, uh, or a significant number of them, will, will perform commercial operations and will perform that in urban environments and they will pose a certain risk to the people below and to the people using the, the vertiports and, and the aircraft. So, uh, for sure, most of, of them will require uh, a certification if they are under the umbrella of, uh, of uh, uh, EASA, 
or maybe a national certification or let's call it licensing if they are outside uh, EASA's umbrella. Okay, so anyway, we will have to certify, license these, these uh, infrastructures. Okay, uh, it will require an increase in workload to the national aviation authorities because uh, it's not only that we as national aviation authority certify or license one, one thing, one infrastructure, and then we forget it. We have to oversight it and it's a continuous work. We have an initial peak of work and then we have a sustained uh, work to oversight uh, this, this infrastructure and to, to keep safety at a, at a very high level, okay? So, uh, as a national authority, what do we need to enable this process? Well, first thing, uh, we as national aviation authorities are not as big as uh, the European Air Safety Agency. We unite in the European Air Safety Agency and then we have power, we have a lot of power, regulators and industry to develop high quality regulations. And this, the PTS are one of these high quality regulations that we have developed so as the states that don't have such a big power for regulation can use this mm, to have uh, homogeneous and safe uh, vertiports all along Europe, okay? So we will need a comprehensive, uh, a complete set of regulations, not only for the vertiport, but also for the operation and uh, for the air navigation around the vertiport and so on. If EASA will provide us with this set of regulations, it will be easier for us to, uh, to certify these vertiports and uh, have them operating, okay? And then we will need, of course, uh, as a national aviation authority, to have a team prepared to perform this certification, so we will need experts, okay? So what are we doing as a national aviation authority? We are already working with, with EASA, we are training ourselves, we are providing our expertise, and uh, we are preparing for the future. We, for example, in our country, we are also uh, reviewing our national uh, regulation about um, this kind of operations to try to uh, allow the certification in the future, okay? So, uh, what are the steps for licensing? What are the steps we will need to go through in order to have a license or a certification of a vertiport in a urban environment? First of all, we will need to check the airspace compatibility of this uh, new uh, vertiport because we'll, we will be in complex airspace in urban environments with the proximity of airports and of the control airspace. And we, of course, will have other users of the, of the urban airspace, such as uh, helicopter emergency operations, or maybe a lot of drones uh, transporting goods to your, to your homes, okay? So uh, we will need to check this airspace compatibility and to see if the, the placement that uh, they suggest us is, is, uh, is a good place uh, regarding the, the rest of the airspace. Um, next step. And uh, we as uh, national aviation authorities will not be a big part of it, but uh, the developers will need the support of the local authorities because we can only authorize or license or certify a vertiport if uh, inside the urban environment is the authority of, of the city cooperates. If the land use is correctly regulated, Okay, and if they can obtain commercial licenses, this is the first step, and uh, this is their task, and uh, we will try to support, but this will be their task, okay? Uh, the third step would be, okay, we have very, very serious environmental regulations in Europe, and we, we take environment very, very seriously, okay? So, uh, what will be the, the main preoccupations of people uh, in the city. Will the aircraft be noisy? I don't like noise. I'd like to fly in one of those uh, vehicles, but uh, do I like to have a vertiport near my home? Will it be noisy? And uh, maybe we have complaints, but if the aircraft comply with the noise regulations, then there will be no problem. But they have to comply with the noise regulations. And we need data from the manufacturers about the noise of the, of the aircraft to, to plot these noise contours and see if we comply. If we comply, it's okay. And then, again, uh, environment can mean limitation of the arrival and departure paths over the city because there may be things that are sensible to the flights and uh, we want to avoid them. And last but not least, we need social acceptance of our business because if a city is against this kind of flight, 
we will for sure not have this kind of flight. And uh, we, we will need this social acceptance and this community acceptance because they will prefer, perceive there is a risk. And uh, whether the risk is real or not, it can be perceived as a risk. And we need to communicate to people it, it isn't a risk. It is as safe as the rest of the aviation. And you can trust us. You can fly. And uh, you can have the vertical port in your city. Okay. So environmental impact assessment that we as national authorities need uh, before we uh, authorize any project. Okay. And then uh, we will begin with BFR man operations, which means we may not need any uh, navigation service, any certified navigation service or transit service. But uh, as the number of flights increases, as the tempo of the, of the infrastructure increases, we may need some kind of separation of these BFR flights in the vertiport. So, with uh, the current regulations, um, national authorities may begin to ask, uh, how much do you want to fly there? Do we need any kind of service to separate yourselves one from each other so as you don't crash in the air? And, and, uh, and uh, uh, you, don't, you are not a problem for the people below you, okay? And uh, this is something we will have to face, okay? Then, um, once all the previous steps are okay, you know, the, the airspace compatibility, the, the, the problems with the, with the local authorities for land use and, and, the, and the, the authorizations of, of commercial uh, operations in a, into a city. Once we have the environmental impact assessed and reduced, and once we decide we don't need mm, specific uh, air navigation uh, services in our vertiport, then we, the guys and girls uh, of infrastructures, begin certification. Okay, that it may take place after, uh, I don't know, between eight or ten months before we have asked to certify a vertiport. We need all these first steps done before we begin, and then we begin with with a certification license process that you all know because it is similar to the certification license process of a heliport or an airport, and uh, we'll have to check compliance with a vertiport, vertiport technical specifications. We will have to grant construction of the vertiport. We, we will have to, devel to develop a vertiport manual with all the uh, procedures and description of the, of the vertiport. And then we license or certificate the vertiport, and we have the commissioning. It begins uh, operations. And then we will need to perform continuous oversight, continuous monitoring, and safety improvement of the operations. And that's basically the whole picture. It's easy to say, and uh, it will be harder to do, but uh, we will push. So as uh, we get our vertiports in our cities and we get these, these operations. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Arthur. I think uh, this uh, gives, uh, gives us a very nice picture of how, uh, what is the level of coordination that is needed uh, between the different stakeholders uh, to, to achieve a proper deployment of vertiports. And, uh, uh, for this as aspect, the, uh, the national authorities, they play indeed a fundamental, a crucial role. And uh, those are, uh, now you have a better idea of what is needed to be done for the future. Uh, this brings us to the, uh, now that uh, we have already taken a look at uh, what's happening on the authority side, I, it's time to move to the, uh, to the industry. And we will start, uh, we will now involve to uh, the future vertiports operators. And we have here Simon Wally, is a, a chief regulatory officer for, uh, for Skyport and basically is leading the uh, company's global regulatory and safety oversight uh, function for its passenger and air taxi infrastructure uh, around the world. He has a, a large experience uh, in aviation, uh, aerospace, and infra infrastructure sectors. Uh, as he worked uh, in the London Gatwick Airport, ro uh, member of Royal Aeronautical Society, and uh, also of Institution of Civil Engineers. So now, uh, Simon is in, in his role basically is uh, helping governments, regulators, and also uh, the development of standards. Uh, to basically to, to promote and uh, deploy advanced air mobility. So um, maybe that's a good, uh, what maybe now you may be able to offer us a, a, your vision or perspective of and trying to have an understanding and appreciation 
um, how important will be the prototype technical specifications for uh, the uh, innovative high mobility operations and uh, what is the importance for the um, uh, of these specifications and what are the novelties uh, when compared with the existing requirements for heliport design Thank you, Giuseppe, and thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, pleasure to be here and to, to see so many of you here this afternoon. So I'll just give you a quick background about what we do. Uh, so Skyports was established in about 2017 um, with the purpose of designing, developing, and operating the infrastructure for advanced air mobility. So we manage the entire process of site selection, site acquisition. We do design and build, and we uh, complete the operations for vehicle agnostic vertiports. So we work with all of the different types of OEMs. Um, across the world, we have uh, projects. We're headquartered in London, but with offices in Singapore and on the east coast of the US, but with projects in Asia, Europe, and um, the Americas, as well as the uh, Middle East. All of our vertiports will have to, and we intend them to comply with uh, vertiport design regulations that, through the form of the guidance that's been published, we now have a reference from which to which we can work. So this was an important first step to provide the level of certainty that we would require to be able to design before building our vertiports to agreed standards. So if we look at what the, the specific benefits of the EASA PTS is to uh, relative to uh, heliport design criteria, I think the first thing to note that it was a very pragmatic stack by EASA to use ICAO Annex 14 Volume 2, but also Volume 1 and the Heliport Manual, because to in, for intents and purposes, VTOLs are very similar to helicopters in the way they behave, but they're not quite the same. Uh, but either way, it provided a useful foundation for something that the industry was familiar with, the, the national authorities were familiar with, and it meant that we didn't have to uh, start from scratch. We had a foundation from which we could pr pragmatically build some design criteria at quite a good pace. And actually, two and a half years, even though it felt like a long time, probably was relatively quickly in comparison to, say, how ICAO SARPs for, for, for vertiports are likely to take. But as I said, vertiports are, or, or VTOLs are not helicopters. Um, they come in lots of different shapes and sizes and configurations. They have different forms of propulsion. Um, and so what we needed was a, a flexible form of cri a criteria that would fit around the wide range and the large number of vehicles in the, in the market, in the development, and their configurations, especially at a time when we don't really know how the industry is going to shape out, uh, the, sh the OEMs are going to shape up. Will there be some mass consolidation? Will they all coalesce around a single configuration in the, in the same way that helicopters are today. We just, we just don't know. So we needed something that was going to accommodate lots of different types of, of vehicles. So I think using the helicopter design, but with managed deviations, was a very good pragmatic step. Um, it enabled uh, VTOL operations in congested areas. So the whole purpose of urban air mobility is we're trying to solve you know, congestion on the ground, provide a complementary service to ground or surface-based transportation, uh, potentially to help reduce uh, carbon emissions. Um, and based on the fact that this is uh, supports or, or facilitates the operation of category enhanced vehicles, um, and the design, the steps or the innovations that were included within the PTS, particularly the obstacle-free environment uh, or the obstacle-free volume, for example, um, gave us a means of developing vertiports within those in congested environments. I don't want to give any kind of impression that that will still be easy because 
the authorities have still got to adopt these within their, their national rules framework, and uh, local authorities have still got to have a means of, of accepting it through the planning application process. But it does give a framework that authorities, whether they're national aviation authorities, but also local planning and approval authorities, can point to something that a regulator of international standing has approved um, and that they can adopt. Uh, one of the, the, the very uh, positive de uh, developments was the, the geometric stand design. So on the, the, the vertiport layout that you can see at the moment, we've highlighted how a configuration of a, you know, multi, uh, a fixed wing with multi-rotors is not, conf not configured like a, f a helicopter where it has a round, uh, a round stand, as you would see in the helicopter in the heliport design criteria. And because also a lot of VTOLs will not be ground tax, they will not be air taxiing. They will be to save the preserve their battery. They will likely be ground taxiing. And so adopting almost like heliport um, airport um, taxiing arrangements, and to reduce the sizing of the space taken for the movement area, having a geometric stand that can be adapted to the specific types of vehicles that will be using the facility means that you can effectively save the amount of space you're going to have to have at a vertiport to have a FATO with multiple stands, and you can really squeeze them in. Um, it also helps with site, the site selection. So as I said, there's a clear, the clear definition of the physical characteristics required, which would always be determined by the largest vehicle based on the D value of that vehicle. But also the the obstacle-free volume enables us to accommodate VTOL, uh, VTOL operations within a congested environment, so effectively either with trees or buildings surrounding them. Now, the, uh, to operate in that environment is still going to be defined by the performance characteristics proven through certification with the ARSA that, that it can achieve the, uh, the required performance within that volume of airspace. So to a certain extent, if we choose an environment in which um, only a few VTOLs can operate, that can still op give us a means to have a solid business case, and it, it can safely accommodate those aircraft that have proven through certification that they can execute the maneuvers required to get in and out of that site. So it gives us a lot of flexibility. Um, and I think that comes on to that final point, that I think that the ASA were very, very pragmatic, and it was um, uh, great to see that the aerodromes section, as well as the airworthiness team, were working very closely together to work out a solution that didn't tie the hands of the OEMs or the, uh, the vertiport operators or the developers, but enabled that obstacle-free volume defined by unknown parameters but those parameters will be defined through certification. So it offers maximum pr flexibility. So I think we need now need to look and prioritize about what we're going to be doing with this document now that it's been published. So I think it's absolutely essential that the member states have a clear idea about how they're going to adopt this within their rules framework, at least before there is an EASA regulation. Um, I know that a lot of the member states were involved in the, the plenary of the Vertiport Task Force, which was, of course, very welcome, and it helped advance it quickly. Um, but I think we need to have a lot of clear guidance on how quickly it's going to be implemented, how will it be implemented, will it be implemented in full or in part, and give clarity to the industry that are very, like Skyports, that is very keen to, to make progress on um, developing those um, Vertiports. Um, even though this is guidance and it's not pan-European in the sense that the NAAs can do their own thing, I think it's really important that we try to see a harmonized approach, not only within the ASEAN member states, but also around the world. So using this to influence the likes of the development of IOKO SARPs, which will be uh, commencing later this year, but also as the FAA is developing their engineering brief for vertiport design, having a positive influence so that we don't create two separate sets of rules.
Um, and I just wanted to talk about the op vertebrate operations that um, uh, Arturo has already um, suggested that would be something that the NAAs as well as the ARSA will be looking at for the, the, the licensing or the certification of uh, vertebrate operations, of which, of course, vertebrate design will be part of that, those, those requirements. So um, EASA does not focus on the operations. Um, I currently um, chair the subgroup five for ground within the Urukai Working Group 112 VTOL and the lead edif editor for the guidance material on the operation and for guidance material for vertebral operations and operators. So we're effectively looking at developing the initial criteria for a licensing or certification regime for the operation of vertiports, which is designed to not overlap with and complement what EAS has done on vertiport design. So in effect, we're, we're looking at what are the likely criteria for a vertiport manual, um, bearing in mind this is for scheduled commercial operations where we likely see there will be a mandate for certification. Um, we're looking at things like, you know, management structure of the Vertiport company, uh, qualifications and training, um, the SMS, but also looking at things like re rescue firefighting, um, emergency procedures, wildlife, um, FOD. Um, now, whether EASA choose to use this as a means of compliance is entirely up to them. Um, and even if they don't, but they decide to do their own certification requirements for Vertiport operations, then we would hope that, as an industry, we've helped move that forward quite quickly and have the, the basics so that they can they don't have to start from scratch. Oh, and that's my presentation. So, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Simon, <coughs> for offering the perspective of the future vertiport operators. Uh, just as a reminder, uh, here's the slide. So, if you want to uh, push question to the the panelists use the slido go to, uh, and use the hashtag 718893 for the event to promote your question uh, for the session after the, uh, the introduction uh, of all members. So we move to the next panelist, uh, Gonzalo Velasco uh, is the leader in Ferrovial for the development of business plans for airports. Um, he's a member of a board of Heathrow, Aberdeen, Glasgow, and Southampton airports, and chair of AGS Health Service and Security Safety, Security and Sustainability Committee, and the chair of the uh, ACI World Non Aeronautical Review Revenues Committee. So he basically is in charge uh, of all the initiatives in Ferrovial uh, for the development of, uh, of Vertiports. And uh, to Gonzalo, I would like to ask, uh, wh why do we need uh, vertiports regulations at this stage? So what is the importance and how the industry will benefit of it? Thank you. And I will try to explain it in, in the slides, why it's important for private investors that develop infrastructure for vertiports in this case. So, yeah, here we go. So th this is the seat, really of why we are here. And according to Lilium and other EV toll manufacturers, they are going to come to market very early. And if we've heard what Arturo has told us, probably we are already running late if we want to have dedicated infrastructure just for EV tolls for this new type of aircraft. So although we are taking the steps, IASA is taking the lead, obviously, in, in all of this, in creating the framework and, and the right coordination among stakeholders, the reality is that we cannot do well a lot. So we need to continue working and working pretty fast if we want the whole value chain to be ready for this new ecosystem. So if we have new technology, this wonderful aircraft, we also need to develop something that is, is new. It's, it's not just taking the traditional airport model, airport infrastructure, and doing a little airport just for, for the EV tolls. So what we need to come up with is with a new concept, which is basically very aligned with EV tolls. It's zero carbon, zero carbon operation on the air, on the ground, 
obviously there won't be noise or the noise will be as low as cars. The idea is that these hubs, because at the end of the day, they are going to be intermodal hubs, will be very integrated within the cities. And obviously, we want them to be located as close as possible to that point of origin or destination of the user. Because that is the way in which Lilium, Volocopter, others will be able to make money. Because if they are located at remote places, then it will be very, very difficult to, com to compete with existing modes of transport. And obviously, <coughs> within the different steps of the passenger journey, we need to make sure that everything is as seamless as possible. So we don't replicate the current hurdles that we have as of today at airports. And this is the roadmap that we see that we need to address in the coming years. Putting airside or space navigation aside, because there have been a lot of panel discussions uh, around it. Yesterday, we talked a lot about the community engagement and social acceptance, and, and I cannot reinforce more how important it is. Regulatory framework, which we are discussing now, and then the intermodal ecosystem. And as I was alluding to before, this is key. This is what we call the time factor, this, this connectivity of the first and last mile. Because e even if the journey in the air is very, very short, if that first and last mile or that process through the vertebral infrastructure is not seamless enough, then the whole purpose gets diluted. So the PTS is really important for the design of this seamless journey that, that we are talking, and is critical also for that optimal location of the Bertie port. In essence, we obviously are very in favor of continuing with this regulation and, and with addressing all the legal framework that needs to be considered in order for investors like us to have a stable framework going forward. And based on this framework, we have already designed our, our guidelines for how we want to develop vertiports. And actually, these are actual sketches of a, a vertiport in Florida that we want to develop in the coming years. Obviously, we need to think that it's an infrastructure, that it has to be flexible, adaptable, we are in a very early state on, on knowing how these aircraft are really going to operate. So we need to be conscious that in the coming years, there will need to be adaptations. But we need to start with something. That is the reality. And these are the benefits that we see from regulation. So it's not that regulation okay, is it's, it's, it's not against investment. It's, it's the other way around. We want regulation, we want an, a stable regulation in order to be able to invest millions in infrastructure. So it's important that it provides clarity in terms of the, of the requirements, that there is certainty in terms of the process, that the processes that we need to follow, that those processes are shortened as, as much as possible, but safety is first, obviously. So we, we cannot have shortcuts there, but if, if we have addressed the safety issues, then the rest of the bureaucratic processes should be a speed up. And our, as Arturo mentioned, the integration with local planning, that is key. And incorporating cities into all these discussions is, is key from nowadays. It's very important that they start to understand how these new air services are going to be integrated with the ground services. And if there is any new development in the city, like any train station or, or transport hub, that there is an allocation for a Bertie port. So that, that's why it's very key. And the consistency across geographies. And now we have a framework in Europe. FAA is starting with, with some guidance. And we are already starting to see that there are some differences. So this is, this is quite concerning. And we would like, obviously, 
for regulators of different regions of the world to speak with each other and to have consistency. And finally, there are many elements that need to be addressed and are critical for the operation of the Verti ports. We've talked about firefighting systems, but also the charting infrastructure is key. And it seems that every EV toll manufacturer is coming up with a different equipment, um, which could be great uh, for them, but perhaps it's, it's not great for, for the user and for making the whole value chain viable for everyone. And towing, towing is another issue <coughs> that we face, talking with EV toll manufacturers, because most of them are not going to be able to move around to taxi in the airfield. And if we want to have a lot of volume of operations in order to reduce the ticket price and make the whole value chain work, then we need to think about all those things. So yes, food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gonzalo. And I think we can move now from Vertiport operators to Evitol operators and have the perspective from, uh, from Lilium. We have here today uh, Saskia Horsch. Uh, she works at uh, uh, Lilium as head of global launch. And uh, she's responsible for the uh, relations with governments, regulators, and aviation agencies, and also all other partners across Europe on political and regulatory matters. Uh, she has a previous experience in uh, Amazon for more than 10 years uh, and also uh, worked at um, the European Commission uh, in a director general uh, for, for competition. Um, Saskia, can you tell us what do you believe are going to be the key uh, success elements of uh, infrastructures that would enable Vito manufacturer to to operate and uh, deploy urban mobility. Yeah, thank you, Giuseppe, and thank you very much for inviting me to share some thoughts on on an uh, eVTOL manufacturer's perspective on uh, on infrastructure and ready ports. Um, let me just start from here. Um, so before I turn to your question, let me just first give a, a very short introduction or overview of. Um, what Lilium was about and what we're actually um, creating, trying to create. So we, the company was created like seven years ago by now with um, the vision to enable new air mobility. So uh, air mobility that is um, high speed, sustainable, uh, very quiet, um, accessible, um, based on a, an aircraft that um, takes off and lands in a vertical manner. And so we're by now 700 people in the headquarters in Munich, in Germany, that are working to uh, build this beautiful aircraft that you see here, um, which is powered by batteries, so fully electric, um, hence uh, zero op operating emissions, which is the, you know, the, the basic idea that we, uh, that we uh, had as a, a goal to, to achieve. Um, we, it, is, uh, it has a novel um, architecture um, with a, a, a cabin design that can uh, cater for different um, uses. Um, uh, the idea is to have you know, uh, passenger transportation, of course, that's the focus, but then four-seater arrangements, six-seater arrangements, also you know, using, using the confederation for cargo um, if, if, um, if you want. The architecture is pretty novel, so the technology behind it with um, 30 engines that, um, that power the, uh, the aircraft. Um, and the reason why we went for this uh, uh, technology is because we wanted to make sure that we can optimize for noise, since we want to be able to uh, operate um, uh, in, in sort of densely populated areas. Uh, you need to be, this needs to be quiet. And so the technology, the way it's, um, the, the engines are arranged and the, you know, the way you can put um, noise, um, acoustic liners in it, um, basically allows for to achieve low, low noise profiles. Um, the, the aircraft is also, I mean, it will be certified um, as a normal commercial um, passenger aircraft and hence the security standards. It will achieve the same security standards as other um, commercial um, aircraft. One thing that is also um, particular about um, the choice of the, the technology is that we wanted to make sure that we can 
build up a, a viable um, uh, a business model. And we think that um, with this technology, we will be able to um, achieve regional connectivity, which is, I think, what people will make uh, will attract to use this new mode of transportation. Um, regional connectivity, so think about distances, uh, Munich to Nürnberg, for example, in, in Germany, or Amsterdam to Antwerp, for example. And we think that this is, um, you know, this will be a, um, uh, an attractive point for, for people because it saves time, right? We compete with other modes of tra transportation. If you look at short, distances, you compete against taxi or, or the public transportations in inner cities, you will hardly gain space, uh, gain time. While if you go regional, then of course, you know, if you look at routes where there's no high-speed connectivity, for example, high-speed train connectivity, or where you don't have, uh, you know, direct connections, or where you have um, uh, lots of traffic on the streets, this is what people will make, um, will be attracted to use um, our new mode of transportation, right? They will really gain um, a lot of time uh, traveling. Of course, we need infrastructure to, to opera operate. We need to land, uh, start and land from, um, uh, from, from infrastructure, and we want to build up a network. So one vertiport is not going to be enough. We want to have um, a network of, of vertiports where uh, the aircraft um, can, can operate from. Um, we for to establish these, these this infrastructure, we work with um, different um, partners um, um, around uh, the globe. Actually, focusing on those regions which we have committed to to start our service first, which is um, Florida in the U.S. Um, and then to German regions um, here in in Europe. We work with partners like, for example, Ferrovial. Gonzalo just explained uh, initially. Um, uh, particularly in, in the US, um, where you know, uh, Fairfax comes with a lot of expertise and, um, and knowledge on how to um, build up this infrastructure. In Europe, we have sli a slightly different ap approach. So in Germany, we would rather focus on, um, on infrastructure projects close to airports. And so we uh, team up with um, airport partners um, to, to establish the, the infrastructure. Um, there again, in, you know, Apple partners being super knowledgeable on how to uh, how to create um, uh, landing uh, infrastructure. So now, what are the key enablers for vertiports? What are the key criteria to look for when uh, when uh, considering um, vertiport locations or vertiport establishments? Of course, the first one is um, is location. Um, you would, uh, and I think Gonzalo said it before, right? You, you, you have different use cases. In our case, when we look at passenger transportation, you would want to have uh, a very port, not totally somewhere where no one is going to travel to, but it needs to be quite central. It can be an airport location, for example, because there is lots of people moving around, connecting. Um, but it, it obviously, you know, uh, should, could, and should be also a centrally, you know, city location. Um, think of uh, um, um, a mall, you know, shopping center, think about trade fairs. So, in essence, any location where people move, where there's people flows, where people connect from one transportation mode to the, um, to the next. Interoperability being, <coughs> you know, one key criteria, I think, for the, for the choice of, um, of location of a very port. Um, obviously, and this is the beauty of this regional network, um, we can also connect more remote locations, but even if you're more remote, you would want to choose a very poor location that reaches the people that actually use the transportation mode. Um, the second criteria that is important is performance-based design requirements. So what does that mean? Um, obviously, you know, the, the very poor needs to cater for different, uh, for different VTOL um, performance um, or different behaviors. It needs to cater for different locations. So, um, very ports will be, you know, will be on on garages, for example, or on, on the top of buildings. They will be on the ground. They'll be in an environment where there's lots of obstacles, um, or, or maybe not. Um, different operators, EV2 operators, will want to um, use the 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 infrastructure. So, it is important, and I think this is what where IASA did a very good job in the PTS, um, is to to really be include a, an element of flexibility to cater for all these different um, elements. 
Um, approval processes is one topic that we deal quite a lot with, and I, I listen to your <laughs> um, contribution quite carefully. Um, obviously, right now, um, there is no... So when you look at the national um, uh, member states level, which is where basically uh, uh, infrastructure will be approved, so ready ports will be permitted, and um, there is no dedicated framework at the minute, and so um, we, you know, we work on the basis of what is what exists, so the regulatory frameworks that exist. Um, uh, basically, helicopter, uh, helipad, um, technical design standards that are being used for the permitting. Um, and what we see is, uh, you know, lots of different, or first of all, lots of uncertainty from the uh, from the uh, the regulators, but then also different you know, requirements that they set up, different studies that will be asked for. Um, so, you know, a lot of different levels of authorities that we need to go to, wh whether they want the aviation permit or the, the construction permit or the fire protection assessment or the environmental assessment. So it's quite complex system to go through together with the, um, the very poor partners to, to actually manage um, all of this. And so, um, more harmonization would obviously be key here to make it leaner and more, more you know, more easier to navigate. Um, and here again, uh, very happy that PTS was now published, although it's not binding, as you repeated several times. Um, it will give authorities uh, a lot of guidance, um, and I think they've been waiting for this um, for quite some time. Um, airspace integration is another one a very important element. Obviously, some of our, as I mentioned before, some of the infrastructure that we're looking at are located in very complex airspaces um, at airports. Um, what we want to make sure is that we can fly in and out um, without a impacting in any way the runway throughput, uh, which I think airports wouldn't be very happy with. <laughs> On the other hand, also making sure that um, tower operations are not burdened with extra work, um, um, but at the same time allowing eVTOL operations to do as many movements as possible. We want to start small, but then, of course, scale up um, um, in, you know, in, the, in the years to come. And we want to obviously make sure that this uh, whole, these whole operations are um, you know, uh, meeting highest um, safety standards. And so um, we're working quite closely, very closely with um, ANSPs to make sure that there is a solution, at in particular at airport locations, um, that caters for that, that allows for sort of independent um, operation um, while ensuring safe, super safe standards. And then, of course, community acceptance. I think that was mentioned already quite, um, uh, you know, from, from other um, speakers. It is absolutely key. In any case, in the approval processes, communities will be involved in various um, forms. Um, as a, a manufacturer, we want to make sure um, that communities are involved and engaged and informed as early as possible um, without buy-in from communities. Um, of course, this you know, this model is not going to work and body ports are not going to be approved. So this is an absolute key requirement to make sure that we bring people on our, on our journey. And finally, uh, a few, uh, here you can see a few designs, like this is reflecting some of our thinking we've done in the past um, on how uh, body ports could look like in the different, catering for the different environments. So, um, you know, sort of uh, single operation, complex operations with six to eight stands on the, uh, um, on the um, roof of a park deck. You can see one, the other one on the ground, and then obviously in the inner city. So this is just showing, reflecting some of the designs that you could encounter um, in, the, in the future. And with this, I've come to the end. Thank you very much, Saskia. Thanks for all that uh, uh, I've submitted questions uh, on Slido. Uh, I've seen that there is a quite the, the, the presentations have generated quite a lot of interaction on Slido. We have many, many questions. I don't think that uh, we will be able to address all of them uh, given the remaining time, but uh, don't worry, we will try to provide an answer. We will collect the answers and uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll provide an answer and we will publish those answers on the, on the ASA website. Uh, together with the link to the event. Um, but maybe we can use the remaining time to, to address some questions that have attracted quite uh, some, uh, uh, some interaction. So, 
The first question would be is uh, uh, for, um, I would say, for, 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 uh, for, for Predrag and also for the Vertipore design. So what about Vertipores and aerodromes and Vertipores on top of a shopping mall? What is the diff will there be any different requirements between, in terms of design for Vertipores that will be on top of a shopping mall and Vertipores that will be in an aerodrome, in a standard regular aerodrome? Frederick, and thank then thank you. Gonzalo uh, and Simon. This is, I think, what I already, already, already mentioned, more or less, in, uh, in my presentation. Um, standalone vertiports, which are not in the scope of EASA, EASA rules, are standalone on, uh, based on the National Aviation Authority requirements. So either they will take uh, PTS or some our rules when it comes, it's, it's different. When we have vertiports at the aerodrome, if the aerodrome is in the, sc is in the scope, also vertiport facilities are in the scope. If it, is, uh, if it is on the garage, house, or whatever, we have a requirements. Probably also the rules will be similar to our, to our PTS. So as I said, we have uh, departure, destination, and vertiports for uh, alternate vertiports for CSFL. Design requirements are always the same. Thank you. Simon, uh, Gonzalo, maybe a short reply in an SMS I, I, format? <laughs> I, yeah, I will be very short in, and, and alluding to, to this. I, I just want to clarify that a lot of people get excited with Bertie ports on top of shopping malls, garages, uh, etc. The reality is that there are very few structures that are ready or that are, are prepared to, to handle eVTOLs. Okay? So, so I think that is a misconception that, that we need to, to start to address. Um, uh, the only thing I would add is that, uh, reinforcing what Predrag has said, that the beauty of the PTS is that you can apply it everywhere. So the design criteria will be the same, whether that's on, on, on the surface or uh, at, a, at a site that's elevated, say on like a parking, a parking lot, um, multi-story car park. But the, the complexity of being able to build on a structure that will then facilitate eVTOL operations or a vertical, having to go through all the planning, permitting, buildings, codes. It's much, much more complicated. So when you're using an aerodrome, that existing facility for aircraft, particularly that doesn't require an obstacle-free volume that you can use existing uh, departure and approach surfaces, it probably is a lot easier to deploy at an existing aerodrome. Thank you. I have a question also for, uh, for Arturo regarding the role of uh, uh, local city government in the authorization, in the process of uh, authorizing uh, vertiports. Yeah. How do you see this? Uh, mm. Well, you have uh, several different authorities with different uh, competencies regarding the authorization. And uh, we as national aviation authorities, we are on the part of, of uh, safety, and we and uh, we will try mm, to uh, authorize vertiports that comply with uh, with safety regulations and that are safety and efficient to use. But then you have uh, authorities that will uh, that have the mission that you comply with with uh, with environmental regulations. This is the, the this is not the Ministry of Transport, this is the Ministry of, of, uh, of Environmental Issues. So you have to comply with them. And then if you want to operate in a, in a city uh, and you, you tell the local authorities, I want to operate by the main hospital of the city I, and I want a flight, it's five minutes. They may tell you it's not a good place for you. They will need to regulate the land use so as it is compatible. And uh, this, is not the, this is not the competence of the, of the National Aviation Authority, it's the competence of the local authority. So those ones that want to, to, to build a new, a new vertiport will have to handle of this, all these, um, all these uh, needs and they will have to comply with different regulations and that's the point, I think. Thank you, Artur. I have uh, an interesting question for Sask as well. Um, because the, the PTS, has, they've been uh, conceived uh, today, they're based on input from uh, developers of current eVTOL designs, so in terms of size and concept of operations. Uh, but we don't need to, well, we have not to forget that also the, the seat mile economics plays a role in the design of an aircraft. Do you think that in the future, the design of aircraft may grow in such a manner that would require a rethinking of the vertiport design? This is an interesting question, and I think, um if you think very, very long term, then probably there will be some rethinking to be done. But I think 
um, looking at the, the concepts um, that we're uh, considering at the moment, and I've just mentioned four-seater, six-seater, um, and also the sort of based on the the, uh, the uh, architecture, the technology that we uh, that we're using, um, most likely uh, there will not be uh, the need to reconfigure or redesign or reopen uh, this, the, the specifications that have been worked on, um, given that there is um, you know there are flexible and they have been they have been conceived um, with with uh, models that grow uh, in mind. So I don't think that this is um, pertinent. Uh, in the near term. Good. I have one last question common to everybody. Um, how, uh, what would be the role for, for the EASA, for the national authorities, for vertiport operators and for EVTOL uh, manufacturer in order uh, to foster uh, societal acceptance of uh, urban mobility and specifically for the construction of vertiports in uh, in cities. Maybe we can start from, from Predak and then go through the line. Uh, I would say shortly, uh, we are looking for a har harmonization as much as, as, as possible. We are looking for uh, your input, uh, uh, data and verification of data, and uh, the second step of uh, creating vertiport rules. Thank you. Thank you, Predak. Saskia. I think it will be very important to, um, to educate, to inform, to engage, to bring the the public closer to what we're doing, to um, uh, give them the look and feel, um, take away the concerns that people might have. Um, anything that flies, you know, might might raise concerns um, with uh, with people. So, um, you know, being very transparent and open, and um, and um, you know, bringing people close to demonstrations, I think, is going to be key, so that people actually see it safe and it's something that will benefit them. Thank you, Saskia. Arturo. Well, I think uh, we cannot can do nothing to prevent this this business to develop and happen it will happen if uh, if we are able to convince uh, people that it will be useful and uh, it will not be a nuisance or a risk then we will have it coming earlier but uh, it will come for sure Gonzalo yeah. your turn I could add that we need to communicate better safety and noise issues because th those are according to to their stats what people are concerned about. And, and for me, what is more important is to address the non-users. The users will come, but the non-users are, are the ones that we really need to communicate. Uh, just add two things. So the first thing is to try to, to bring it to life, to try to bring vertiports and advance their mobility to sort of in its physical form. I mean, we, we produced, or in 2019, we developed the first full-scale passenger air taxi vertiport prototype in Singapore. There are about 8,000 attendees that came along and interacting with it. And it's an opportunity to provide them with the means to ask questions, to understand how it will operate, how it will understand or work with the vehicle or interact with the vehicle. So things like that are really important. And then the second is that every vertiport is inevitably going to require planning or permitting a site approval through local planning authorities. And through that, there will be public engagement um, working with local officials. So there will be a, a social acceptance for not only the operations, but actually the site location and build of these facilities will be a, such a key for element of this whole industry. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, our time uh, is, uh, is over. I would like to thank you uh, for all panelists for intervening today. I hope that the discussions have been uh, stimulated your curiosity um, so and we look forward to welcome you at the next uh, high-level conference on drones I'm sure that we will host a new panel of vertiports with additional interesting discussions thank you very much for joining <laughs>